Daydre, afternoon. How are you doing? Uh, you're big again, so this is our tomato field here. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, where we make your soup. Tomato pests. Tomato paste, tomato puree, whatever you call it, <laughs> for the salads and everything. This is the space where we do make them. So, uh, are these yeah. uh, already transplanted from the greenhouse or you just did the open field? Alright, so these are open field. We did the nursery under greenhouse. Then we transplanted them, uh, when was it? About uh, 10 weeks ago. So the, this this crop is around 10 weeks. So, yep, uh, here we are now. Uh, this is an indeterminate variety, which is why you are seeing this trellising pose. By indeterminate, we mean those crops which grow taller and taller and taller. Okay. Yeah, okay. so you'd find out that maybe this pole is actually shorter than where this crop will go. So that uh, at the end of the season, we would have extended this this pose to accommodate the, the, the growing length. So how many, uh, I was about to say potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this time with the potatoes. Uh, mm. How many tomatoes are we expecting uh, per plant? Well, let's talk of cages. With this indeterminate, well, realistically speaking, we look at 10 cages per plant. Yes, over a You mean span this of, one plant? Mm-hmm. 10 wow. kgs. So if I have a growth period of around at least three months, because we do harvest at least three months. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. What about uh, the size? The size, well, uh, currently they are still small, but they'll get bigger. Like, uh, they'll fill your palm, mostly. Those will be the average sizes. But as they continue growing, like maybe fourth, fifth, sixth month, they'll start to get smaller and smaller and smaller, probably because the crop would have grown older and stuff. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, you know me, my mm -hmm. story, it's always about production. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to know, like, uh, your production process, mm -hmm. well, how, how you do it. Okay, so in tomatoes, we have what we call tuta absoluta kakonye so that one is a it's bad news it's a tornado in farming because they uh, the feed on leaves like they literally eat anything on the tomato plant the leaves uh the fruits if waste ca if waste comes to waste it will even start to borrow uh these these terms you know so that's how bad it is we also have bowworms they also burrow into the tomato make sure that you won't even sell anything because if it is borrowed if you it's, it's no longer film it's just uh what can i say it's just damaged board so um after twitter we have diseases okay. uh late blight early blight with those diseases it's they can completely wipe out your crop so you have to be on the lookout every day scouting to make sure that uh, they don't get to you by surprise you get it? Seen these ones are uh, bigger yeah there's yes 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 so it will only take a week or two for those small ones to to get to bigger marketable prices and also to to ripen because uh, if you look around some of them are starting to to ripen they are now a bit orangish like they are no longer green so I expect that around mid-December we will start to sell something and mm -hmm. hopefully the market also would have responded for the better because currently the prices are across all these other commodities they are just you not know, so good including the potatoes we talked about the tomatoes right now it's going for around eight dollars per crate or less uh, we are used to 15 20 going upwards of course you can still make a good profit with eight dollars but yeah we're used to bigger profits but uh, i would like us to talk about uh this issue mm. that, that that happens in terms of uh tomato production uh we have situations where uh the market is flooded mm -hmm. with tomatoes mm -hmm. and people now tend to then throw them away when it's now uh off season mm -hmm. for tomatoes so uh, as an agronomist, like, what do you think could be the solution to actually care of that problem, if we look at it? It's just an open discussion. Well, I can only think of value addition. Nothing else, because once the tomato is ripe, it's ripe. You can't do anything about it. If there is no buyer, anyone willing to buy them, uh, the next thing, 
they are going to to decay rot and stuff so maybe we could start to look at value addition but uh okay uh, how like you can just give me like examples that mm. also focusing on like mm. small scale farmers because i've actually seen that those mm. are like the bigger producers mm -hmm. in terms of uh local market well for to keep things simple we could drive them Mm -hmm. And after the drying, uh, uh, farmers used to they use uh, a pistol and a mortar or duri. Mm -hmm. Then they crush the dried tomatoes to make a tomato powder, which will then be just put into vegetables, meats, stews, and then they will flavor it up and stuff like that. Now, uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 I do understand what you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. We are going to they have to crush, make uh, the, mm -hmm. the powder. Mm -hmm. But now let's look at. Uh, like okay people are value adding but they do, they're not going through that uh packaging process like mm -hmm. branding yeah which actually decreases uh their chance of being seen because mm -hmm. you might discover mm -hmm. but then the the thing of being seen because i've been seeing like uh, a lot of farmers throwing away their tomatoes mm -hmm. and i'm like don't they know anything about value addition or is it costly or you know yeah thing is first of all it's costly and for our, our environment like in here in Zim, unfortunately, uh, not a lot of people are willing to buy those powdered tomatoes, tomato paste and they stuff, the because tomatoes. the fresh ones are readily available, whether in winter, summer or what, mm -hmm. they're readily available. So it's actually a challenge if you're being realistic about it, such that even if you do consider doing the uh, value addition, it becomes even more costly. Other than just reason, other than just uh, throwing them away, or <laughs> just conserving them for your own uh, warm consumption, otherwise yeah. people won't really buy the market. Our market really hasn't responded much to value addition in tomatoes. Have you ever gone into a supermarket and bought tomato paste? Roy Not Roy <laughs> Tomato paste, tomato so puree. I don't know. You oh see? yeah, the puree, yeah, no, I haven't. You yeah, haven't, yeah, right? You just go to, to the market yeah. and get your fresh tomatoes, yeah, right? Yeah, definitely. So if you don't buy, then who? <laughs> you see, so that's the problem with uh, value addition in, in, in tomatoes. Maybe to improve with time, but uh, for the meantime, it's just something else. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I, I heard you talking like uh, tomatoes are now available all year round. Mm -hmm. uh, will it be like this same variety or it's a different variety that we're looking at? Same variety. So uh, what farmers have started to do these days is, uh, for instance, we're in Marondra in winter we can't do tomatoes. Mm -hmm. I then move to areas where it's warm like Chipinge, Banket, where the areas are not attacked by frost. I start growing my tomatoes there. A lot of extra there uh, to cover up for all other farmers who are not uh, uh, doing tomatoes. And most of farmers are now being nomadic. They follow where there is a, there is a good weather for what they want to grow. You see, so after Marondra, they go to Banket, they go to Pinge, you know, all those areas which are a bit warmer during uh, May, June, July, August. So tomatoes, uh, therefore, are just available all over. Like, we used to know that uh, around um, July, August, tomato prices uh, per, per, per crate, they range from 50, 40 to 50 dollars. But now that people are now moving from, from these cooler temperatures to where it is warmer in producing more tomatoes, the tomato prices are now just terrible. It's very rare for a credit to go beyond twenty dollars these days, no matter the season. Oh, oh I, I, I see. Yes, I understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, now um, my question, mm -hmm. right? I, I what, let's talk about cost, mm -hmm. cost of production. How is the cost of production? Uh, if I want to start tomato uh, farming, and then I'm thinking, okay, I have this certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. What's like the minimum amount of money that I need? And also this uh, cost, including the pesticides, the herbicides that I needed. All right. Uh, root controllers. Well, from a commercial perspective view, uh, uh, where we use things which are all standard, the poles, the drip lines, all the necessary fertilizers, let's talk of around 6,000 per hectare. Okay. That's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. But for commercial. small scale farmers, they can now then uh, adjust that, firstly, by growing what they call the determinate types. Uh, they just are uh, bushy, they don't grow tall, you don't need the poles, the twine, no, you won't need all of that. You just make sure that uh, you just plant and your crop is healthy. You find out that your cost of production could go to something like 2,000 
or less a thousand to two thousand if it is standard if it's just uh, someone is just starting they can even manage with less than a thousand dollars but of course compromising the quality and uh, the lifespan of the crop in the field okay yes okay. Yeah, I, I understand mm -hmm. so uh, what's the use of twines for tomatoes is it too okay so this is uh, we call it the trellising twine so basically what it does it, it trains the tomatoes they need to be growing up right so we just train them guiding them strand by strand to make sure that they grow upright if there are no twines they'll just sag they'll drop down when they when the tomatoes um, uh, um, get in touch with the ground mostly they'll go bad Oh. So we have to make sure that the tomatoes are not on the ground because they'll get disease from the from the soil and stuff like that. So we have to make sure that it's well trained. Uh, the fruits are not in, in contact with the ground. And also, the characteristics of this variety is to grow tall. So we aid that by putting the trellising twines. Oh, oh, you get it? oh, oh I, I see. Yeah. Uh, now, now let's talk about the most common diseases that, that we are expecting. Mm. What are the most common diseases that, that you are facing right now uh, in terms okay. of tomato production? So uh, I've mentioned them a bit earlier. It's uh, early blight and late blight. Those are the most common problematic diseases. But lately, we've been having uh, fusarium, fusarium and bacterial wilts where your tomato just wilts and die. Okay. Well, I would say for no apparent reason, but of course there is a reason. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, for for fusarium, it's a fungal disease, uh, which just attacks our stems. Then it's just it just dries off. It cuts off the supply of water going up to the plant, so it will just uh, wilt and die. Just like that. So you have to come into a preventative fungicide, uh, preventative bacteria side, virus side, because sometimes we really don't know what's attacking your crop. So you better use those broad spectrum uh, chemicals, uh, which tackle or uh, almost uh, all of the diseases that you are suspecting. Okay, okay. Yes, okay. so that's how we deal with it. And then the most common uh, pests, I've also mentioned them before, is the uh, your tutor absoluta, uh, your red spider mite, and the bowworms. Those ones are the most uh, crop uh, pests which attack our crops. So just if to thoroughly spray your crops include your weekly routines you spray maybe at least twice a week to make sure that you do not give any room for this pest to come in and breed before you come again again and spray because once uh, for example once you have two in your field it's really really difficult for you to eradicate it completely from the field you'll be just fighting with it for the rest of the season and it will increase your cost of production so just dealing with it on a prophylactic basis or on a preventative basis is far much cheaper because you'll be using cheaper chemicals which are just uh, uh, disturbing the life cycles unlike fighting something that is already in there we have to come in with the uh, weapons of mass destruction <laughs> to, <laughs> to make sure that it won't destruct you because it's either it's they win oil. or we win <laughs> so yeah we as humans we do whatever we can yes okay okay yeah. uh now uh let's go to weeds mm -hmm. weeds you know the the those that disturb the crop mm -hmm. not the weed you know well, yeah, so yeah, in tomatoes, we just come in with our walls, we weed, we really don't use um, herbicides. Why? Because well, some tomatoes, uh, the flowers are sensitive to stress, because herbicides, they do bring stress to the plants. So if we were to spray uh, the herbicide, you might find out that there will be flower abortion of which the flower is the one which will give us the fruit so definitely we need to keep them so what we just do is uh, we, uh it is part of our production cost to make sure that uh the field is always clean and we do it manually oh. using the walls then we ridge sometimes just bring in the cultivators with cows just to cultivate in between the rows to make sure that uh we deal with the weeds uh mechanically not chemically get it if you don't get it, you may as well forget about it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I do get it. <laughs> okay, yes. uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I do get it. Mm -hmm. um, now, mm -hmm. I want to ask. Yes. I, I'm very curious, you know. So now we're, we're going to water, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how did you, how do you determine your cycles? Good. Okay, now it's time to irrigate. Now mm -hmm. it's not the time to irrigate, you know. Okay, so what we do is uh, normally after every two days, we come in with our drip like we are seeing, it's currently irrigating. Mm -hmm. We just run it for two hours. It's been two hours. Can you see it? the whole bed is actually wet now? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's wet. Yeah. So what we do then, if you come back again in two days, uh, mostly it will be dry because it is so hot. If not, what we just do is we do the bolus test. Uh, if you get the soil like this uh, and squeeze it, you should be able to form this boy. If not, you need to put in some moisture to make sure that you have enough moisture. So that is how we determine uh, we need to irrigate or what. It's either you just you, you just look at your crops, yeah, I know we need to put in water, or you do this, or you just take the schedule after every two days. That's okay. it, yes. Because uh, considering that you are running your farm on um, commercial scale mm -hmm. i thought like there'll be like ph saying what do you call moisture sensors mm -hmm. you know, and well i uh, not yet uh, we are still yet uh, still moving the traditional way <laughs> We will get there definitely, but uh, not at this time. We are still doing it manual, I like so. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. It's a wrap. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long day. Definitely, and it's I'm been so tired. A long day. And I don't want to be in your life. This is for <laughs> Come on. It's interesting. No, no, no. Yeah. no. I think I think we should be like going to to the chicken farm and get you know some chicken yeah. for 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 lunch. Oh. <laughs> okay. You gotta pay. <laughs>